Late in the sixth century, Pope Gregory the Great wrote these words, Scripture is like a river, broad and deep, shallow enough here for the lamb to go wading, but deep enough there for the elephant to swim. It is this stirring image of a river that has often come to mind when I think of the role of God's word in my own life and in the life of the church. I call to mind the many rivers I have seen in my lifetime so far. There's the Arkansas River, the spot where it merges with the Poto River in western Arkansas, where I learned to skip rocks as a teenager and then taught my youngest brother to do the same. In my mind's eye, I can see the Jemez River in northwestern New Mexico. One fall, I was making a retreat and staying in a hermitage just near the edge of what looked to be a very small stream and not a river at all. But in that rocky, dry landscape, I soon came to see it as a beautiful silver necklace running through the countryside. I think of the first time I saw the Nile River in Egypt and the massive width of water that gave life to everything around it. And of course, there's the muddy Mississippi with its barges carrying the means of industry through the middle of the U.S. and stories of Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer that bring it to life. And then there's that beautiful Jordan River that in some places in Israel is a mere trickle and in other places almost too deep for baptisms to be safe. Water, rushing, moving water, is a marvelous image for the sacred writings that we call the Bible. There is great power there, power for reshaping the landscape of our world and of our individual lives. But there's gentleness necessary for coaxing us into greater and greater trust. There's a calming sound of water lapping on the shore, almost inviting us to come in to at least wade where we can be comfortable. There is depth in this river of God's word, calling us out into the deepest waters where we simply must surrender. Pope Gregory the Great has provided an image that helps us to see the reasons for appreciating and savoring the, the Bible in the life of faith. The image of the river, safe for the lamb and deep for the elephant, tells us the why of Bible study and prayer. What we will do in this course is continue to ponder the why of Bible study, but most particularly we will examine some of the what's and how's within our Catholic tradition. What is our understanding of the Bible and its purpose? How do we best approach serious study and reflection of these sacred texts? It should come as no surprise to you that many adult Catholics approach the study of Scripture with a bit of trepidation or even intimidation. Perhaps some of you began with those feelings or are still feeling that way. I think there are logical reasons for this. For one thing, most of us continued to grow in learning in so many fields that affect everyday living. We went past grade school and learned more about literature or balancing banking accounts or investing money in stocks or bonds. Most of us feel at ease reading an editorial, understanding the sports pages, or deciphering a recipe. But many of us adult Catholics have not engaged in serious study of the Bible since we initially learned the Bible stories while in grade school. In other words, we feel rather adult when we sit down with the Sunday newspaper but rather inadequate when we don't know our way around the Bible, or we can't figure out how to find the footnotes or even where to locate a particular book of the Bible. These are not insurmountable problems. In fact, we can quickly become more at ease finding our way around the Bible with just a little practice. And that's one of the beauties, too, of studying with a group of people. We can help each other along the way. Another thing that might become an obstacle is the word study itself. Sometimes we see or hear that word and our minds go back almost reflexively to a competitive learning environment where right answers were rewarded and quick understandings was expected. There is nothing inherently wrong with this kind of setting, but it's not the setting for Bible study. And we have to work hard to communicate that message. Bible study is not competitive, and it's not even about perfectly right or wrong answers. Rather, it is about developing an understanding that continues to expand and will have a direct impact on the way we see the world and the way we live within it. Also, there are many adults who have become so accustomed to a particular way of learning that they're uncomfortable with different techniques. For example, a typical approach to teaching and learning in the Western Hemisphere has involved lectures from someone seen as an expert. The expert feeds the listeners information. We might be quite comfortable with hearing the words of an expert and never dream that we too bring some expertise to the process of learning. To truly learn, the good listener has to find ways to digest the information and not simply listen passively. 
experts in adult learning point out that adults have at least two strengths that make a lecture-only format kind of unsatisfying. Adults, unlike children, have a wide variety of life experiences that can help as we try to apply teaching to our lives. And adults, unlike children, can think critically and need to do so in order to make learning last. Our own United States Catholic Conference of Bishops in the year 2000 issued a very important document entitled, Our Hearts Were Burning Within Us. It's about the importance of adult faith formation and the appropriate techniques for adult learners. In this document, they identify a number of principles for conducting adult faith formation. One of those principles is stated in this way. Respect the different learning styles and needs of participants, treating adults like adults, respecting their experience, and actively involving them in the learning process. In that same document, the U.S. bishops state, maturity of faith is the intent of all catechesis from the earliest years, and they call for a lifelong deepening of faith in Christ. It is this lifelong deepening of our faith that makes Bible study so important. We come to the text of our scriptures not simply to learn in an intellectual way, but to encounter Christ who is truly present there, and to grow as disciples of Jesus as we grow in loving understanding of the kingdom that he preached and embodied. Our church gives us ample tools to make Bible study possible and effective in our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Up-to-date and accurate translations of the biblical text make it easy to read in our own primary modern languages. Well-researched footnotes help us to identify and understand vocabulary that might be foreign in some cases, as well as explaining some of the background of a particular text so that it makes better sense. Cross-references in one book of the Bible provide the chapters and verses in other biblical books where similar teachings might be found or expanded upon. Contemporary commentaries make the best of recent scholarship available to lay students of the Bible in language that is accessible and clear. We do not have to be experts in Hebrew or Greek to grasp the text because that scholarship is available to us. We do not have to be archaeologists or cultural anthropologists to uncover the situations and values of ancient times. That scholarship is available to us. We do not have to have degrees in scripture, in theology, or church history in order to have enough background information because that scholarship is available to us. It is not necessary to be a cartographer because a wide variety of maps help us to situate the story in its geographical setting, and that scholarship is available to us. In 1965, the Second Vatican Council produced a profound document on divine revelation, the constitution named in Latin Dei Verbum. In chapter three of that document, the bishops deal with inspiration and interpretation. In that section, modern readers of the Bible are encouraged, in their words, to search out the meaning which the sacred writers really had in mind, that meaning which God had thought well to manifest through the medium of their words. This requires attention to the literary forms used by the human authors. God's truth can be communicated through different forms of writing, such as poetry, epic storytelling, letters, and liturgical songs. At the same time, we are encouraged to honor the divine author of the text and give attention to the unity of all scripture and the sacred tradition of our church, to always consider the total context of what we study and its use within our Catholic tradition. If you'll bear with me just a bit more, I'd like also to refer you to the 1994 document issued by the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Entitled, The Interpretation of the Bible and the Church, this document reviews many of the methods and approaches used by scholars in their work with scripture. It deals with questions that arise as a result. It outlines characteristics of a Catholic approach to the Bible and considers the role of biblical interpretation in the life of the church. In the conclusion of that document, the commission acknowledges that not every Christian is able to pursue the painstaking research that the Bible demands of scholars. We read there, this task is entrusted to exegetes, those who engage in scholarship to help interpret the scriptures, who have the responsibility in this matter to see that all profit from their labor. In other words, biblical scholars do not function in a vacuum or only for the benefit of academic institutions. Their work has to be made accessible to lay Catholics like ourselves. 
The task of these biblical scholars in the words of the Pontifical Biblical Commission is to fulfill in the church and in the world a vital function, that of contributing to an ever more authentic transmission of the content of the inspired scriptures. Simply put, in the Catholic tradition, the Bible is to be accessible to all its members. Accurate translations, along with faithful and painstaking scholarship, need to be available for our use as we move into adulthood. Studying the Bible in your parish or with other believers in your homes does not have to be a painful academic process. With materials such as those we produce in the Diocese of Little Rock, we know that good scholarship can be paired with solid spirituality in an atmosphere where faith can grow. We engage in Bible study not just to fill our heads with information, but to use that information in ways that can help us to grow as individual disciples and as active members of our faith communities. You'll notice in the commentary for this particular study that the author, Stephen Benz, has written 12 topics that are of particular interest to Catholics who are engaged in Bible study. Whether you are new to the process or you've studied the Bible for years, these 12 topics covered in six lessons will help to articulate what we as Catholics believe about the Bible and will describe the tools we use to understand the Bible more clearly. In your first lesson, you will be examining the Bible as God's self-revelation. In particular, you will be introduced to the profound meaning of the covenant God makes with us through both testaments of our Bibles. This divine gift of covenant invites us to commit ourselves to the Word of God and to the transformation that the Bible does bring about. The second lesson is a very practical one. How do you know which Bible to choose for study? Are some better for study than others? Why are there so many translations, and is it helpful to look at more than one translation when reading, praying with, or studying a text of Scripture? This is also the lesson that will walk us through the nuts and bolts of getting around the Bible, finding chapters and verses, and even making use of tools that are in the pages of our Bibles but might not be used very often. Even experienced students of the Bible might be able to discover the benefits of knowing more about using this one book that is really more of a library than a single volume. In your third lesson, your study will focus on both the Old and New Testaments and how they came to be shaped over centuries of oral and then written traditions. It is also a time when you and your group will begin to examine the value of both the human and divine contributions to this book that we call the Bible. And best of all, you will better understand how the Bible is both the product of the church's lived tradition and the guide for its continued life. Lesson four will direct you to numerous places in your Bibles that reveal the variety of literary forms used by the human authors of scripture. With that background, it will be time to discuss the historical reliability of the Bible, as well as the ways in which we can validly interpret scripture. In today's world, we might feel bombarded with as much misunderstanding of the Bible as valid understandings. So lesson five will address the issue and dangers of fundamentalism, a topic that can open up clearer understanding about other Christians as well as better self-understanding. Related to that topic is the formation of the canon of Scripture and the decisions about including various writings among our books of the Bible. The sixth and final lesson of Introduction to the Bible helps us appreciate the contributions of biblical scholars and the various methods they use to help us to answer the question, what did the passage of Scripture mean at the time it was written? It is only after we grapple with that original level of meaning that we can begin to open up its meaning today and apply it to the way we live in the world. All valid uses of scripture in the present have to be rooted in this original meaning, the world being addressed, the situation at hand, and the needs of the original audience. And then we have a better chance of allowing the word of God to address us in our circumstances. When I was in college, I would sometimes find myself praying and looking for answers from God, and I'd simply open up the Bible, and I'd try to see what God was saying to me at that time. As I look back on that method, I began to refer to it as Bible roulette. What did I expect to find? Probably an easy answer, or even a sense of direction. But what did I usually find? My eyes would search the page until something appealed to me that I could make address my situation. In those years, I had not come to appreciate the value of context 
or of understanding God's message in view of the total book or the stories that surrounded the one verse that I might pick out. I didn't really make good use of my footnotes or cross-references, and consequently, I could easily misunderstand a passage altogether. Without searching the passage and asking the questions about what the author was originally addressing, I came away with a shallow appreciation of the Bible. It was an appreciation, but not a very deep one. I don't play Bible roulette anymore. I've learned that God speaks to me and my situation best when I've immersed myself in the community of faith and in its sacred writings, when I've studied and prayed with a text in the larger context of where it is found, and when I've allowed texts to address me even when they don't seem to necessarily fit my expectations of how God works in the world. Introduction to the Bible is the kind of study that can help you move from a simplistic kind of experience with the Bible to a more mature and fruitful one. You might be surprised to know that many adult Catholics cannot articulate how we use the Bible or how our understanding of its message might differ somewhat from what we see in popular religious media. Even those who have carefully studied a few books of the Bible using good Catholic commentaries are not always sure how our understanding of scripture can be described to others. These next six weeks will help you appreciate our rich biblical tradition. I hope you'll come away with a deepening desire to continue studying God's revealing word. To paraphrase Pope Gregory the Great, maybe you'll want to come to the river and take a good long swim. <laughs>